Here it is, my uh, first morning back in Mesot, and the first task of the day is the one I've been uh, planning for and kind of dreading. I have to go to immigration and apply for my next uh, extension of stay. And I'm, 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 I'm relatively confident that I can get one, at least I was told I could, but you never know, of course, when you're dealing with uh, immigration issues, who knows what has happened <laughs> while I was in the north doing the uh, Mei Hong Son loop. So yeah, I'm heading to immigration right now, and within an hour, or even within half an hour, I should uh, know quite a bit more. E <laughs> I still got my uh, rented scooter, I still have it, so I can ride it out to immigration and back, so that should be, uh, make things pretty uh, easy to do. Yeah, I really enjoyed my night here in this hotel room. I've sort of started this habit of analyzing hotel rooms and their design. It's sort of an interest of mine, I guess. So I've got a couple of thoughts to start the day with. One is in this room at the Panu, a large double room, really nice room. I'm really comfortable in here. I wish I could uh, stay, uh, stay a long term. Yeah, it's a very nice room. It's got a lot of features that I really enjoy. And a few things jumped out at me overnight that um, are really nice qualities to this room. One is a high ceiling. You may not notice that when you first come into a hotel. But it kind of hits you over time. It's like, man, I really feel good in this space, and why is it? And then you notice, oh, it's got like a 10-foot ceiling. Ah, you know, that, that kind of adds a really good feeling to a room. And I noticed that the air conditioner is over here on that wall, so it's not blowing directly onto the bed. And that's something you see in so many places. The air conditioner will be right above the bed or it will be on the wall opposite the bed and it's just blowing cold air right on the bed. And that's not a very good thing. So when you see an air conditioner on a separate wall blowing away from the bed, that is really, really nice. And same thing with the bathroom. A big problem with a lot of uh, hotel rooms, particularly if you're traveling with uh, another person, is that the bathroom and the bed generally has absolutely no separation. The bed will be right up against this door, a very thin plastic door that goes right into the bathroom. So there's no privacy at all in the bathroom and any embarrassing noises you might make in there just fill the entire room. But this room is different. I really like it because the door opens away from the living area of the room. You know, there's the bathroom there and the door opens in that direction and that's really nice. It feels you've got this separation between the two and the wall is a real wall. Look at that. It's a solid, thick wall which blocks all the sound from the bathroom and the door is like a heavy duty sliding door. So it's a very tightly enclosed split, uh, space, keeps all the noise in. And it's not just embarrassing noises, it's just noises you would make. You might want to wake up early, take a shower and, and, and get ready for the day when you know your partner, whoever that might be, is still trying to sleep. And in a lot of rooms that's not possible because the bathroom is like right on top of the bed. But here it's uh, nicely uh, separated. And there's some more solid structures in here, which I really appreciate. So many of these rooms just have like a plastic shelf that they've screwed into the wall and they're always tilted. Everything falls off, the water, you know, collects on them. But this hotel seems to be an older structure, an older design. And here the mirror is embedded into a little alcove, which gives it a flat, and solid counter on which you can put things. And I, I, I really like that. It just, uh, yeah, it's a really nice, uh, really nice design. I pointed out when I moved in that I really like having the light above the bed with a light switch within easy reach from the bed. The one downside of this one was a, there was only one light bulb. This little yellow one here you see that it throws almost no light at all, but I travel with my own light bulb and that's it over there on the right. And uh, so I screwed that in and now it just blasts a lot of bright light over the bed and it really makes it very comfortable and cheerful in here.
So I'm a, <laughs> I'm a huge believer in traveling with your own light bulb. That's probably my number one travel gadget that I have. Just a light bulb. Another unremarkable but really useful thing is just this. They built in a couple of shelves. So there's a shelving unit here. You know, this is where they had the coffee and tea and soap and shampoo and toilet paper. And then they put another shelf directly underneath it. And I find that really handy. I've got my coffee and spoon and water down there. And then another shelf right above the fridge, you know, where you can put the kettle, things like that. I talk about this a lot, just small items that cost next to no money can add so much value to a room. And a little shelves like that um, fall into that category, as well as things like this uh, towel rack, you know, for drying clothing. Not very expensive, but uh, very useful in a room. And of course, my fabulous end tables, one there, and of course right there. <laughs> I always pull it away from the wall so it's an easy reach with my right hand and I've got my cup of coffee, my uh, Tim Hortons mug, sitting right there. So I've been sitting there all morning with my laptop on my lap. And these chairs are really comfortable, these rattan chairs and then a nice little table right there. So high, uh, high marks for this room, though today I might be moving from this double into a single just because I don't actually need all this space as nice as it is. And the single room is 100 baht per night cheaper and considerably cheaper if you rent by the week or by the month. So we're, I'm waiting to hear whether a single room opens up today. Anyway, I'm, uh, I'm procrastinating. I think I'm just too nervous. I don't want to go to immigration, but I'm all ready to go. So let's get on the scooter and uh, head to immigration. It's about seven or eight kilometers outside of town, right at the uh, Friendship Bridge that crosses over into uh, Myanmar, which of course remains closed. Two years it's been closed. I, st I, 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 I still have trouble believing that it's been so long since uh, COVID changed the entire world. Anyway, don't want to talk about that. Let's go to immigration. That's my room there. I don't even know the room number, actually. Uh, 3101 is my room. These are all the double rooms on the left, and I think uh, on the right, those are the uh, single rooms. I find it hard to believe that all the rooms are full, like that all the single rooms would be occupied. I think they have a bunch on the second floor, too, but maybe they're not actually open. Maybe they only have the three on the ground floor. It's a nice place in a way, well in many ways, it's set way back from the road with down this long narrow uh, entryway, so it's very, a lot of security I guess. And of course you're away from all the uh, traffic noise, which is always a plus. I can really feel the temperature difference down here in Maesot compared to where I just came from. Places like uh, Mae Hong Son, even Mae Sarang, Mae Saryang, and Pai. I guess those places are considerably higher and therefore uh, much colder than down here. So uh, yeah, right now it's a little bit chilly. And most people would be wearing a jacket, I think, but I'm just wearing a shirt, my immigration shirt. <laughs> so I have a t-shirt on underneath it for extra layers. I've got my, my immigration shirt is my only shirt with buttons. Always want to make a good impression at immigration as you can. So I'm going to stop and get gas. And, uh, get something to drink. I still have time. Okay. Uh, 
GoPro is uh, tilted <laughs> because I've got the scooter sitting on its uh, kickstand. Yeah, I just stopped to uh, fill up with gas. I figured out on this trip that it costs, I think, 80 baht per 100 kilometers for gas. So you can, so I can sort of calculate how many kilometers I'm going to go. Every 80 baht, <clears throat> I get 100 kilometers. I think, I think I figured that out. And I got some milk. They open at 8:30, and it's about five to nine right now. I like to arrive at nine o'clock. You don't want to show up at 8.30 when they just open the doors because they're still settling in, turning on their computers, chatting with their co-workers. So I don't want to show up and make them start working as soon as they open the door. So I give them until 9 o'clock to sort of get settled into their daily routine. And then I show up. And as I mentioned several times, my current extension of stay expires today so I have one shot at it <laughs> so it's kind of an important uh, important day yeah I had an unusual mishap here at the gas pump doesn't often happen or actually never happens but I think dealing with a foreigner sometimes throws them off their game and the, the girl who was filling up my tank she sort of lost uh, track of what she was doing and a whole bunch of gas you know, spilled out all over the place and filled sort of this um, overflow area around the gas tank. And she took my money and then she wasn't going to do anything about it. And there's all this you know, gas sloshing around in there. And I thought, uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't like that. So I did indicate to her with sign language, like, do you have some kind of a rag here? We can soak this gas up a little bit and she went and got a rag and uh, cleaned it up for me so that was nice but yeah that doesn't usually happen something else I've learned is if you want to fill the tank all the way to the top you don't put your scooter on its kickstand because then the whole bike is on an angle and then you can't fill the tank all the way to the top so what I do now if I want the maximum amount of gas I can get, then I put the scooter on as a double kickstand, so it's sitting perfectly straight up and down, and then you can fill the tank all the way to the top. So that's what I do now, though. I haven't mastered the technique of pulling the scooter back onto its double kickstand. It's awkward, and I figure there must be a way to do it that's easier, because I find it really hard to do. I'm doing something wrong. I have to work on my technique. <clears throat> ah. Ah. One other random note. Uh, when I went into the 7-Eleven, I noticed all the other customers, they walk right by the thermometer. Like nobody is getting their temperature taken anymore. I do it automatically because it's, it's habit now. But I noticed a lot of people are just ignoring it now. It's kind of interesting. This is it on my right. That's the entrance to the uh, Friendship Bridge. And when the border eventually opens, that's where you go in and then uh, on foot or on, in a vehicle. Then you can walk across this bridge that takes you into uh, Myanmar. Every time I come here, I'm just astonished again to see that empty bridge. So here's immigration on my left, and here's the entrance. 
And there you go. See that sign right there? Motorcycle parking for visitor. It's amazing. We can just park right in here. Very quick visit to immigration, in and out. I'd filled out all the forms in advance back in my hotel room. I had copies of everything already. So I made sure I filled everything out, had all the photos I needed and documents. Everything was signed, pre-signed, just to make it as fast and smooth as possible. And I was the only person in the immigration office here in, uh, in Maysot. They call it the TAC immigration office, even though it's located here in Maysot. And uh, yeah, I was the only person in there, a very small office, and I handed over my stack of forms. Stamp, stamp, stamp. They have to take your picture using their computer's uh, webcam. And uh, yeah, they accepted my application. I think today is the last day you can apply for the next 60-day extension of stay. And uh, they're, they're used to me here. They, they recognize me on site with my shirt, my immigration shirt when I walk through the door, you know, so that they know who I am. And uh, yeah, 1,900 baht for a 60-day extension of stay. The one wrinkle in the whole system is that it's a two-stage process. So I handed in my application today and technically it's not approved yet. I have to come back in two weeks to find out whether it has been approved and then I will get the stamp in my passport that will allow me to stay in Thailand for 60 days. But of course, it'll be 60 days minus the 14 that have already passed. So the 60 days start from when my last visa expires, which is today. So yeah, you have to wait two weeks basically for the process to uh, unfold. But yeah, you just have to plan around that. But we can drive out of the, uh, or I should say ride out of the uh, parking area. It's quite a pack of uh, bridge dogs that all live here. There's a real uh, group of them. There's one, uh, one man who lives under the bridge there. He's been there for probably a year that I'm aware of. He just has a little camp set up there. He sleeps there. And every time I see him, he's busy writing in a notebook. So I guess he's a, a soul of the world, living outdoors, uh, doing, uh, yeah, whatever he does all day. I don't know. I always, uh, when I go to immigration or I come down to this part of Mesa, I always look for him and this camp is always still there and he's always sitting there. And just now he was uh, writing in his journal. I've noticed this often in my life that when you come back to a place that you're familiar with, it can be a lot of fun. As you're roaming around, even in the small towns to the north, Mae Sariang and Mae Hong San and Pai, you're not really going to get lost. It's not like you're in New York City or something. But you do have to stop all the time, check Google Maps, see where you are, try to figure out how to get to where you want to go. And it can be a real stop and start sort of experience. But now that I'm here in Mesot, you know, I can just zoom around effortlessly without even thinking about it. I know exactly where to go, what roads to take, when I have to move over into a lane to make a right hand or left hand turn. I know where all the bumps are, the potholes, the speed bumps. It can be a lot of fun just riding around. Another advantage to coming back to a place you, you know relatively well, and I'm not to be honest, super terribly familiar with all the food options in town. I know the coffee shops very well, but perhaps not all the restaurants. But I do have a few places I know and like. So I think I'm going to go have breakfast at my favorite Burmese tea shop. Perfect time to go there.
can be a fun ride down to the Burmese uh, tea shop. So I thought I'd uh, run the GoPro while I go there. I think I remember how to get there. <laughs> I haven't been gone from Mayside in a long, for a very long, really, in less than two months. And yet it really does feel like a brand new place to me. I'm seeing it with, uh, with fresh eyes. But I'm pretty sure this is the way to go. There's a little bit of a confusing point here where you hit this street where it says, you know, no cars this way, as if it's a one way. But I noticed that all the local people on scooters, they go down this road anyway, and they just uh, make room for the cars. So you sort of uh, hug the left side, let the cars go by. It's a pretty busy, uh, market area. You often see big trucks here loading and unloading. Ends up being a bit of a traffic jam. Not usually this busy though. I don't know where all this uh, traffic is coming from. Sneak through. The big uh, produce market is uh, to the right here, and the tea shop is to the left. I've noticed some changes in Mesot since I've come back, like some businesses that have opened. But other than that, it looks kind of like the same, uh, same town. Ah, what is going on? It's a busy city today. I see a lot of motorcycles parked outside of the tea shop. I wonder if it's uh, really busy today. Hello, how are you? Good, how are you doing? Not bad. Oh. Oh. Happy day. Just came from immigration and they stamped everything and said, so I'm always happy when that happens. <laughs> Thought I'd celebrate at the, uh, at the tea shop. Uh. So it is busy here today. But most people seem to be sitting outside. So there's some tables uh, free on the inside, I think. It's kind of nice. So here's the uh, here's the place. I've shown it a few times in different videos. And uh, yeah, they have a lot of uh, curries that they make out here, and then tea and uh, roti and different things they make over here. It's a really nice place. I'm good, thank you. How are you? Come here together. What's that? Come here together. Sure. Do you want some company? I'm back in my room at the Panu, enjoying my second cup of instant coffee of the day. And I thought I'd end this video about my small adventures of the morning just by telling the story. Uh, the video. Uh, ended when I arrived at the uh, Burmese tea shop, I guess the, the Lucky Tea Garden. And uh, as I went inside, you could see it was really quite a busy place. And there were some foreigners sitting outside. I, I didn't, I had met those people before, but uh, I was in a really good mood coming from in immigration with uh, successful in my, uh, you know, extension of stay application, you know, so I was chatting with them a little bit told them uh, about the good news and uh, how I'd come there to celebrate with a meal at the, at the uh, tea shop. 
And then when I went inside, I was looking for a table, and I walked past uh, one table, and a man sitting there, you know, made eye contact, and he said hello, and we chatted for a second, and then he invited me to sit down and join him. He was eating alone, and he thought, hey, you know, won't you, you know, join me at my table? So I said, sure, and I sat down, and it was kind of a whole um, frantic setting. There was music playing, there was lots of people, there's lots of going on, and, and I didn't want to record this guy you know, without his permission or anything. So I just turned off the GoPro, and the way things turned out, I, I never turned it back on for, <laughs> for reasons I'll explain. So yeah, it turns out uh, this man, it was quite interesting chatting with him. He's from uh, Pakistan, and he had some uh, dishes on the table. There was, uh, in particular, a big bowl of cow hooves you know, the hooves, of just the feet of the cow. And I've seen this dish all over the place and in different countries, and I, I certainly never ordered it, and I've never had it, but that's what he had ordered, and it was like one of his favorite dishes, he told me, and he said it was really good at this restaurant, and I really had to try some. So even before I'd managed to sit down in the chair, he'd gotten another bowl and was taking some of the cow's hooves and putting it in the bowl with some broth and telling me how delicious it was and how good the soup was that came with the cow hooves and uh, he had some naan bread in a basket so he's giving me some cow's hooves and some naan bread and it's like okay you know help yourself have some and uh, of course the only way to eat cow's hooves as I found out very quickly is the standard way of eating for him the way he was eating and a lot of the people were eating around me and that's with your hands it's like this big slippery gelatinous gooey jelly like substance all wrapped around the cow's bony hoof and you're not picking that up with chopsticks or a fork or a spoon. You, you know, you're, you're getting, to get, getting in there with your hands. And, oh man, it was just a sticky, sticky situation all very quickly. So it's not like I could um, turn on the GoPro or anything like that. So I'm, I'm trying to have this a uh, cow's hooves, and that was a new experience. I'd never had that before. It was really like slurping it up. There was no meat to bite into. You just basically pick up this big hunk of cow's hoof and then you're sort of slurping all this fatty tissue from all around the hoof. Um, I'd, I'd never had it before. I had no idea what, what, what it was all about, but anyway, uh, that was a new experience, so I enjoyed that. And as often happens, and I always feel bad about this, this man asked me about going to Canada. He, you know, he said, where are you from? I said, Canada. And he says, well, it was actually his dream was to go to Canada. And he thought it was quite lucky to meet someone from Canada. And I would be able to give him all the ins and outs and details of how you do that. How do you get a, you know, a, a tourist visa? Do you need a, a letter of invitation? What, you know, what's required to go to Canada to visit there? And I always have to tell people that I, I have no idea. I haven't the foggiest. Um, I have no inside information. I have no experience in terms of people getting visas, whether you know student visa or work visa or tourist visa to go to Canada. I, I have the sense that it's complicated and difficult and expensive for someone from Pakistan to go to Canada, even you know as a tourist. I'm pretty sure there are a lot of hoops to jump through. It's not as easy as me going to Pakistan. Uh, that I'm pretty sure of, but even that I don't know. I mean, I don't have any experience, but I basically had to tell him I, I really don't know. I mean, I don't know any more than he does. He probably knows more than I do because he's probably dealt with people in his life who have gone to other countries on a, you know, Pakistan uh, passport. And, uh, all I could say was, I mean, you, you just have to go to the Canadian Embassy and ask them, you know, I want to go to Canada on a, and what do you need? And then go from there. Beyond that, I, I had nothing, no, no information to offer him, which is too bad. But then I told him that, but then as we talked, he kept bringing the conversation back around to that topic and would ask me again. I guess my, my you know, whatever I was saying wasn't really getting through. And I had to repeat it many times that I, I honestly, I have no idea. I don't know anything about it. 
And then things got a little bit more complicated because then he told me later on that his father lives in Canada. And uh, so again, I was thinking, well, there you go. You know, there's the guy to ask on the ground, family member living in Canada. And apparently he'd been living there for decades. So I didn't understand why he couldn't get information through his father. But it was a very interesting conversation. And I, I ran into something I've run into in the past. I should say run into. I, I, I benefited from something I've uh, come across before. And that is the overwhelming sense of hospitality in Pakistan. Because he had invited me to sit down at his table. So that put him in the position of the host me in the, as the guest in his mind, and he's offered me all the food that he had ordered. And while I was there, of course, I got the menu and I ordered uh, potato curry, all my favorite dishes, potato curry, chickpeas, you know, a cup of tea and um, roti, and all of that was coming. And, uh, and then it was time for him to, to go. He had to go start his day. And he summoned over the, uh, the waitress and just indicated, you know, everything on his bill. And he paid for my breakfast. And, uh, yeah, that, that happens a lot when you're, uh, when you're having a meal with someone from uh, Pakistan. It's very hard to, uh, to uh, pay for their meal. I mean, they have such a strong sense of hospitality in Pakistan that uh, chances are they will try and usually succeed in paying for your meal. It's very hard to do the same for them. But uh, yeah, that was a very interesting uh, conversation to have with him. And he told me that he lives here and he works here and he sells cars, is what he told me. And I, I'm very interested in that. Not that I want to sell cars. What I mean is I'm interested in what other people do just in general. To me, that sounds so fantastical. Um, I, I couldn't even understand selling cars in Canada as a Canadian. It's like, how do you sell cars? What does that involve? That's like another world for me. And here we have this man from Pakistan, and he's in Thailand, and he tells me his job is selling cars. And I want to know, okay, like, how does that work? How do you do that? So I started asking him questions, hoping to get some sort of a mental image of what he's doing here in, in Mesot. He's based in Mesot, he told me, and selling cars. And, uh, but no matter how many questions I asked, I could not get it straight in my head. I have no idea what selling cars in Thailand means. Like, does he have a car lot? How, as a man from Pakistan, do you have a car lot in Thailand? Um, is he importing cars from Pakistan into Thailand? And he said, no, they're, he's mainly selling Japanese cars. I was like, well, how do you do that? I mean, how does anyone do that? I mean, the whole world of business is a complete mystery to me. But I, I couldn't really figure it out from his answers. You know, I'd probably have to spend a month with him, going about with him as a shadow in his life before it would finally dawn on me. It's like, oh, that's what you mean. That's how this works. This is what you're doing, you know. Um, but yeah, I couldn't really figure it out from chatting with him. Oh, man, I'm feeling kind of exhausted just from that. I mean, that's already quite a morning for me, going to immigration, good news there. And then I had a nice meal at the uh, tea garden so that was, uh, yeah, it was a very, uh, very interesting morning. <laughs> so that's it for the small adventures of today, a little update video. Continuing in the tradition of tell, don't show, you know, I'm not showing anything in the video. I'm just having these small experiences and then I'm telling about them on a video, which is not what you're supposed to do. But uh, that's what I've been doing lately. The good news is that my back is getting better very, very quickly. Another good mattress here, quite a firm one. I had a you know, pretty good night um, resting my back and after wrenching it in pie, actually. No, yeah, it was in pie that it happened. And after my uh, four days on the uh, scooter, you know, I guess three full days with a really uh, painful back, it's slowly, it's getting better and better. So I'm, uh, 
I'm well on the road to recovery, so I can even sit here in relative comfort in a chair, which is nice. When it first happened, when I first wrenched my back, I couldn't sit in a chair like this because once I leaned back, I would, be, I would have been unable to move forward. I couldn't, I wouldn't have been able to do it. You know, I'd have to have a rope to pull myself because I couldn't uh, tense up my back muscles. But no permanent damage was done. I'm, I'm slowly uh, getting better. <laughs> yeah, Whew. and with that, I'll see you in the next video.